with Liberty Me, here with Thaddeus Russell, author of Renegade History of the United States. Thad, it's great to talk to you again. Hey, Kyle. Good to see you. So you are on this show on Fox Business, The Independents, uh, fairly often. Uh, you write for Reason Magazine occasionally. Um, not as much as I'd like, but a fair amount. And yet you don't claim to be a libertarian. Uh, you don't really accept any kind of label, politically or philosophically. And it reminds me of a uh, Michel Foucault quote I dug up the other day in which he says, you know, I've been called everything from a Marxist to an anti-Marxist to, you know, an apologist for, for corporations to, to just about everything. And he said, all those things on their own mean nothing, but together they mean something and I really like what they mean. That sort of just, why is it important to stay above the fray in terms of, or, or to remain without a label in, in these political and philosophical battles? Yeah. So there's a real principled philosophical reason for not identifying as a libertarian, and then there's a strategic one. Sure. Okay? And I'm completely open, and I've said this to everyone openly. So the philosophical um, reason is, you know, takes a little bit of unpacking to understand, but... Um, there's my major difference with libertarians. And if you look at Jeff Riggenbach's review of my book, he nails it. Um, he understands the difference, which is there is in libertarianism, well, classical, classical liberalism, which is of course the root of libertarianism. There is what has been called, um, the self-regulating individual, um, sort of bourgeois morality. Uh, and Ron Paul is a great exemplar of that. He understands it as well. And that's why he sort of preaches individual morality, you know, the, the argument being that if we regulate ourselves, the state won't have to, which is an intelligent argument. It's just that the problem is it means that this system, sort of this, this, this cosmology of libertarianism depends upon this intense moralism, you know, uh, being a family, don't have sex outside of marriage, you know, value work in itself, be responsible, all that stuff. Um, I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to. I think moralism is a, is a, is a very, um, it's just not my politics. I'm sort of obviously if you read two pages of my book, you'll understand that that's what I'm opposed to. Um, and I think that libertarianism should be truly the politics of self-interest, you know, and that's what I'm interested in. I'm, I'm interested. I'm, I'm trying to develop a politics of self-interest. Um, and so that means not moralizing against others unless they are doing harm to you. Right. Well, not, not even then. Don't. Sorry. Take that back. <laughs> if someone is doing harm to you, don't moralize against them. Simply don't stop them. Simply stop them. Sure. Sure. Um, it, it sounds to me like you're kind of um, meeting out a postmodern view of morality. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, the mor so oh, right. And so one thing libertarians don't understand. Another thing they don't understand is that law depends upon social norms. Right. The law means nothing. The law has no teeth if there's no morality up upholding it. Right. So, the, you know, the, the example I always use is jaywalking in New York. Jaywalking is illegal in New York City, but everyone does it because there's no moral norm right, upholding that law. Right. So it gets flouted all the time. Uh, sodomy laws. Same thing. Right. Sodomy is illegal still in several states. Do people practice sodomy in those states? Of course, every single day, uh, because there's no real powerful norm upholding them. So. Libertarians need to be as opposed to restrictive moral norms as they are uh, to restrictive law. You have quite a storied history in academia as far as being ignored and condemned because you unveil truths to the oh, higher-ups in academia that they don't want to acknowledge. Kyle, hold on now. Oh, sorry. You, What's happening? You used a terrible word. What is it? Truth. Oh, yeah, that's true. Oh, no. Hey, man, we just talked about this. We're both postmodernists. We don't believe in truth. No, <laughs> okay. my, my book contains no truth at all. <laughs> it, is, <laughs> it, doesn't. it doesn't. It's my argument. You can like it or not. That's all I ask. You know, sure, you like sure. It anyway, sorry. Continue. No, that's fair. It's a good break. Uh, <laughs> so why should libertarians adopt a postmodern view of morality? Well, for the reason I just stated, I mean, that, that it's, you know, all the laws that libertarians hate depend upon morality. 
Do you uh, think there's also a strategic reason for it? Do you think it's a good backdoor into academia, which has accepted uh, uh, postmodernism as kind of the? Uh, yeah, right. So if you look, so if you look at, uh, you know, one of my major influences within academia is queer theory. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the first things I noticed when I started becoming interested in libertarians was that they look a lot like queer theorists, um, which is... That is the greatest compliment, by the way. Which way? In which direction? Like, who's being complimented? <laughs> more, I mean, more libertarians. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. But no, absolutely. Um, the, uh, you know, which is to... In the, the queer theory mission is to unsettle... Decenter, denaturalize, challenge all claims uh, of of essentialism, of things being rooted in nature, including morality. Right. So, is is work in itself godly and virtuous? Well, only according to some people that it's not written in nature anywhere that work is in itself is a good thing, or that sex outside of marriage is a bad thing. Right. So, let's get out of the business of essentializing ideas and norms and morality. Um, if you're interested in freedom, I mean, if you're interested in personal freedom, this seems a, a no-brainer to me, that you've got to challenge these ideas that are rooted in places like the church and in the state, um, that particular ways of living that harm no one else are evil or unnatural, right? Let's, let, we've got to challenge that if we are interested in personal freedom. Sure, sure. And I think it's the most natural pairing because, uh, you know, it's an uncomfortable thing for a lot of modern academia to accept. But postmodernism in many ways is explicitly anti-Marxist. Right, exactly. It's, it, it emerged as a reaction to Marxism, as a matter of fact, right? Uh, Marxism does a lot of rooting of things in nature, right? Like, uh, you know, the class struggle, for instance, and, you know, the idea that there's this inevitable... Uh, revolution coming out of capitalism, that capitalism produces these things inevitably. Um, well, no, <laughs> actually. Um, also, but more importantly, the historical materialism, right, is in itself essentialism. It's saying that history, social norms, everything is, comes out of some material basis of society that can't be argued about, right? Um, it's just, it just is. It's an objective fact. There's an, a belief in objective facts, objective truths in Marx, that you must challenge if you were interested in personal liberty, if you were interested in intellectual freedom, if you were interested in free minds and free markets, you've got to challenge that. Sure, sure. Yeah. Let's talk about your new project. Um, a book about blowback and about renegades throughout world history, or at least, uh, you know, starting in, you said the 19th century? Yeah, well, it's a history of it's called it's called Blood and Freedom, and the subtitle is um, a renegade a renegade history of America abroad. Okay. So it's, it's really it's intended to be a textbook, actually, an alternative textbook on uh, the history of American foreign relations. Um, so it uh, intertwines a few arguments. One is the blowback argument. It's just that I take the blowback argument farther back than Chalmers, Chalmers Johnson has, um, all the way back to the 19th century. So um, I'm looking at, like right now, I'm writing about the Philippines, Spanish-American War, the occupation of the Philippines, the colonization of it, um, and, you know, which resulted in tremendous anti-Americanism in the Philippines, in particular among the Muslim population there. Um, and one of the things I found out was that the planning for 9-11 uh, actually began in Manila in the mid-1990s, <laughs> and it was the planning, the sort of the group that was brought there, Al-Qaeda, that was brought to the Philippines to make the planning for that was sponsored by the descendants of the Moro Rebellion in the Philippines. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> that's a long string of blowback there. Wow. Years, right, yeah, so no one's, no, no one's ever made that connection before. Um, and then at the same time, <clears throat> what I do in the book is... Um, I argue that American popular culture, and when I've written about this in Renegade and elsewhere, American popular culture has served just the opposite purpose, that it has, uh, that it has subverted authoritarian regimes abroad and, of course, has caused people to desire and emulate and admire American culture, not the American government and not the American military, but American culture. Um, that it's that's been a, a very it's been a liberating force. Uh, things like jazz and Hollywood and blue jeans. If you look at the history of the Soviet Union, I have a chapter in Renegade on this. The argument has been made not just by me but by many others that those things are what brought down communism. That people wanted that stuff, right? 
It also, it's disruptive of social order generally. States generally dislike the freedom and pleasure, the unbridled freedom and pleasure uh, represented in popular culture. They generally are quite hostile to it. Um, so it, it serves as a sort of dissolving agent, you know, in governments. Um, and that's what it's done in places like the Soviet Union, in the Philippines. Marcos, one of the first things that Marcos did, the dictator in the 1970s, was ban movies, Western movies, because he understood that. Um, so those are two arguments. Uh, and then the third argument I have in the book is that imperialism is the flip side of progressivism, or that it's really the spawn of progressivism. The idea that we are morally obligated to uplift our social inferiors, <laughs> which is progressivism, right, does not, is not limited to the ghettos inside of our country. Progressives understood that. The original progressives understood that they made that argument explicit during the Spanish-American War and during World War I. They said, we are not just obligated to uplift and assimilate and make better the poor people in the ghettos of New York City. We are obligated to do that for the people of Cuba and the Philippines and Guam and Puerto Rico. And then later during World War I, across Europe, all the people who are under the thumb of oppressors must be saved by us and must be made to look like us, may, must be made to be like us. They must be forced at the point of a gun to adopt our culture, assimilated into the American way of life. Uh, remaking the world in our image, and that so that I, my, my argument is that 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 has been not the only reason, of course, that America has gone to war abroad, but it has always been at least that has always been at least a partial justification for the major wars of the United States. There is no such thing as a ma there is no major war in the history of the United States that has not been at least partially justified by the humanitarian argument, and I think it's been genuine. I don't think it's just been a cover for economic uh, motives. Economic motives have certainly been there, but it, I think there's been a genuine humanitarian impulse, which, and I use humanitarian in quotes, uh, that's really been progressive and paternalistic and ultimately oppressive and has ultimately killed more people than it has saved. Sure, without a doubt. I mean, you're not going to get much, if any, argument from me on that. Right. <clears throat> you're, well, uh, is, so it's going to be a textbook? Well, I mean, it's designed. I mean, it's designed for adoption in college courses. Yes. So, is it going to be like 120 bucks? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, it'll be like no. It's like Renegade. It's okay. The same thing. Yeah, it's just it's a regular book, just designed to be used for college courses. But it, well, it's designed to be read by anyone. But it's it could and should be used in college courses, right? If you're going to teach the history of American foreign policy, foreign relations. It would be a great book to use in your course. Absolutely, and everyone should. That's, and I'm glad that you yeah. found a way to tiptoe around the uh, the awful uh, monopoly on textbooks that that creates such expensive and and ridiculously. Uh, yeah, no, it's not being. No, it's not a. It's Grove Atlantic. They're an awesome mainstream but independent publisher, commercial publisher, but they're independent, and it's it'll be you know relatively cheap. Like Very regular, nice. You know. Very nice. Yeah. Well, I look forward to reading it, and I look forward to uh, speaking with you soon again in the future. Thad, it's been a pleasure as always. Awesome. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks so much. All right. Bye-bye.